There is a lot to cover today, from the new RTX 5000 series of graphics cards, the new DLSS features all RTX cards can use, and the new uses for AI in games, which I'll save for another video, although the possibilities for which I think are very exciting. The new RTX 5000 series has been announced, and much to no one's surprise, all of the rumours and speculation everybody made about it was wrong. I think everybody was expecting the prices to go up this generation, but the VRAM and pricing for the 70 and 80 tier of cards at least seems in line with the previous generation of cards, and we seem to get a 30% uplift in performance and extra DLSS features on top of that, many of which will be rolled out to earlier generations of cards as well. The pricing strategy this time around feels slightly different. With the 4000 series it really felt like Nvidia was upselling all the way to the 4090, but this time around, perhaps because the pricing jump between the 5080 and 5090 is so massive, if anything it makes people consider looking down the stack instead, with the GeForce 5070 Ti looking like the sweet spot to go for, spec-wise, being the cheapest 16GB option in the lineup but wait for benchmarks. What's missing from this? Well, the gap between the 5080 and 5090 is just asking for a 5080 Ti or supercard of some sort to be rolled out at some point. But looking to the closer future, as usual, it's the budget cards that are missing. These do tend to come out a bit later and typically have more competition in the form of last gen offerings. I suspect Nvidia are waiting to see what AMD does next. AMD were strangely quiet about their Radeon 9000 series at CS this year, and I think they were quiet because they were waiting to see what Nvidia were doing with the 5000 series of cards first, so the ball is now in AMD's court. The way it seems right now is, AMD will be focusing more on the low to mid range this generation, as will Intel who have already released their B580, with an even cheaper 10GB B570 coming out in a week's time. Intel still have a few teething issues to sort out, but they're only getting better and it looks like the cheaper area of the graphics card market will see more competition this year than it has done in a very long time. But that's for the future. Let's return to Nvidia for now. We don't have benchmarks for their new cards, but we do have this bunch of charts on their site, comparing their new cards with their 4000 series tier equivalents. We don't get to see the frame rates, just bars to signify how their speeds compare. These bars here are not like for like, because the 5000 series frame gen feature works differently almost doubling the frame rate again. So these are the bars that we should be looking at. And here in terms of raw performance, it looks like we'll be getting a 30% uplift across the board with this generation, as I said at the beginning. But as you probably know already, Nvidia is banking on new DLSS features to advance stuff further. And they're making the claim that thanks to DLSS, the $550 GeForce 5070 will be as fast as the GeForce 4090. That's quite a claim, which I think rests heavily on the new frame generation feature generating twice as many frames as the previous generation can. I'll explain this now. Frame gen technology involves creating artificial frames between every real frame that your PC actually renders. This doubles frame rates with the 4000 series, but since this involves waiting for the next real frame to be rendered first, it inevitably comes with a bit of latency. The 5000 series is building further on this frame generation technology by supporting MFG, meaning multiple frame generation. So instead of just one artificial frame being created, they create up to three between every real frame, which quadruples frame rates and shouldn't come with much extra latency or overhead over generating just one additional frame. It even promises to improve frame pacing by using the RTX 5000 series flip metering. What does this mean? It's too complicated for me to understand, let alone explain. Something something Nvidia Streamline Present Packets Kernel Mode Driver. But in summary, it doesn't change the look of these generated frames, merely when they are sent to your monitor's display, which helps to produce a more visually fluid looking result. But owners of previous generations are not being left out here. The normal single frame generation feature seen in the GeForce 4000 series is also being improved to reduce VRAM usage and to improve performance. So that's nice. But what about owners of RTX 2000 and 3000 series of cards? Well, Nvidia also announced improvements to the rest of DLSS, being DLSS 2's upscaling, DLSS 3.5's ray reconstruction, and to DLAA, which is like native resolution DLSS. So they've achieved these improvements by shifting the AI models over to a better system. To overly simplify something overly complex, it takes into account details across the whole scene instead of just basing enhancements on nearby information. To simplify it even further, we'll be getting better looking upscaling and denoising in games. Like I said, owners of older generations of RTX cards will be getting these improvements, as will older pre-existing games which support DLSS. And we can toggle these new features on using the Nvidia app. Here's a before and after between the old and new models. The newer Transformer model promises better temporal stability, less ghosting and higher detail in motion, but may come with additional performance impact given that the new Transformer model has two times the number of parameters that the old one does. 
Again, wait for benchmarks. You can see in the NVIDIA app that DLSS has become a whole graphics menu where you may favour some of its options over others depending on what you prioritise from your games. It looks like all of these features have been left very toggleable and optional, no matter what it is that you're considering using. They showcased all of these new features in a very, very widescreen visual showcase. I think the widescreen was done due to the format of the presentation. It is very, very wide indeed, and you can see the showcase in a link in this video's description. One of the most exciting new features isn't actually part of DLSS, but is instead part of Reflex 2, and that's their new frame warp technology. A few years ago I speculated about asynchronous projection. The best way I can describe it is, imagine a 360 degree video on YouTube. It might only be playing at 60 or 30 FPS, or 15 but you can still move your mouse about as though it's running at your monitor's refresh rate. It's just the next frame of the video won't come until a few frames later, but it feels responsive to interact with because the angle you're viewing it at will update instantly. Now imagine that same thing applied to a game. It will minimise input lag and the perceived latency to your mouse inputs, especially when you're gaming at a lower frame rate. Now this comes with extra problems in a game because it isn't always rendering 360 degrees around your character. So the problem this warp technology has is, if you're moving your view to the right, there will be a gap on the right hand side of the screen where it's got to guess what's meant to be drawn there. So how do you fill in these blank spaces? AI! Duh! Visually, the artifacts from these remind me of those weird aspect YouTube videos where it's blended with a stretched and slightly blurred version of itself around the edges. I froze the video here and you can see a slight fizz where it transitions between what's being rendered and what's being AI generated. The severity of these artifacts will depend on the speed of your motion and your frame rate. I really don't think it will be a problem around the edges of the screen because nobody's really looking there. But I'd be curious to see how obvious these artifacts are as your character's moving forward through a complex environment of some sort, because then there will be little gaps everywhere. Notice how it interacts weirdly around the gun model as well. This means that it has deep integration into the game itself. Sort of like how FrameGen needs to know not to interpolate the position of the HUD elements, this warp model needs a mask of some sort to know which aspects not to warp, in this case being the gun model and HUD. And in a third person game it would likely exclude the character model from this warping as well. I am very excited to test this out in practice. I really enjoyed using Comrade Stinger's prototype years ago, it really was awesome. The way that one worked was to generate new frames by extrapolating the details in the latest real one until the next real one was rendered. So because Nvidia's one isn't doing that, I suspect it will have fewer artefacts. It's merely getting the frames that have been rendered and is applying a botched job to them to fix their perspective to match the very latest mouse inputs that your PC has received. Now these mouse inputs would normally have to be fed through the entire chain of going through your processor and graphics card and being rendered in the next frame instead. A new generation of graphics cards these days is so much more than just the base hardware. It really is the new and improved features that come with the RTX 5000 series that makes them more exciting than the increased clock speeds and the number of rendering pipelines may suggest. And it's great that a lot of these will be trickling down and helping owners of older generations to extract yet more out of their graphics cards. I'll be doing another video covering the other AI features featured in these showcases, because there's a lot to talk about.